Once again, we welcome you to Moving Forward with Young Voices. We are happy to welcome a new contributor to this week's show. We'd like to welcome Santana Bolton. Santana, thank you so much for coming on today. Take a moment and tell us just a little bit about who you are and what you do. Hi, um, my name is Santana Bolton. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm a legal fellow at Tech Freedom. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan tech policy think tank. Uh, I graduated from the University of Minnesota Law School, and before that, I went to Michigan State University and majored in political science. Um, I live in Michigan, uh, and I have one baby. Well, congratulations. We've got a hot topic to discuss today, and I mean, this is this is one that I think is actually more polarizing than people sometimes think. Um, the title of your article for, for freethepeople.org is J.D. Vance is part of an unconstitutional porn ban push. Now, there have been a lot of issues that have come up in the course of this election cycle. I'll admit, this is one that kind of uh, wasn't on my radar screen. Tell me, what exactly is J.D. Vance advocating for in terms of banning pornography? Is he talking about a nationwide ban on porn? Yeah, so in the past, um, J.D. Vance did an interview with a magazine, and in that in that interview, um, he said he wanted to ban pornography outright nationwide. Uh, Heritage Foundation's Project 2025 goes further, um, not saying that that is necessarily what will be would be implemented in a Trump administration, but it's certainly a policy position that's out there. Uh, Project 2025 says that pornography should be outlawed and that the people who produce and distribute it should be imprisoned. Wow. So that's a, a pretty extreme, a pretty extreme position. And they also claim that pornography has no claim to a First Amendment protection, which is, as I write, wrong on the law. So let's let's talk about uh, why. I mean, look, I, I know of people who would would argue strenu- strenuously that uh, um, porn can have some very harmful effects. And I, I'm thinking primarily in terms of relationships where, uh, you know, it becomes an addiction. Um, but tell me why taking the step of, of making it something illegal is uh, is perhaps not the way to approach whatever drawbacks there are. So, you know, in the United States, we have the First Amendment, which protects freedom of speech and, and expression and says the government um, cannot, cannot Im- infringe on that or impede your freedom of speech. Uh, so people who support a pornography ban usually try to argue that porn is not speech and therefore receives no protection. Uh, But the Supreme Court and the lower courts in this country have held for about 50 years that pornography is a form of speech. So uh, speech is not just um, our like platonic ideal of it. It's not just political pamphlets that you pass out in the um, in the town square. It's also anything that you say on the Internet. It is pictures, videos, music. Um, all of that is speech, and there's no clean and clear way to demarcate between um, quote unquote like hardcore pornography and other other kind of speech. So everything, uh, all kinds of pornography, except what courts call literally like hardcore obscenity, um, is protected. That's the obscenity doctrine. It's part of um, the Miller test that the Supreme Court has established. Uh, And it it sets an extremely high standard for when pornography is, quote unquote, not speech and therefore not protected um, by the First Amendment. So for something, for pornography to not be protected, it would need to, taken as a whole, lack any merit whatsoever and also appeal to like extreme sexual deviancy. Uh, in fact, the court has literally said that pornography that promotes only like healthy sexual desires um, it is protected. So regardless of how we feel about the morality of producing or consuming pornography, uh, the court has said pretty clearly that it's protected in all but the most extreme cases. I know that's a that's a tough thing for especially a lot of people who are more conservative in their thinking and in their values um, because they, they look at it and, well, that's, you know, those are dirty pictures. Of course, you know, they shouldn't shouldn't be allowed. 
but I had, I had an old mentor who uh, put it to me this way, and he said, look, here's the problem with censorship. Either you decide what you will view or read or consider, or someone else does, period. And when he put it that way, it was like, okay, this is why we need to approach censorship, and in this case, outlawing porn, with, with a little more caution than simply it's bad and therefore it shouldn't exist. Yeah, and as easy as we think it might be to decide what's porn and what isn't, and about that, you know, that's where the famous I know it when I see it line right. comes from with the Supreme Court. Um, in the law, it is not quite so easy to differentiate between, for instance, like sex education materials and pornography. So what if there is an illustration that is meant to sort of be like medical or instructional, like in nature. Um, is that pornography? Is a book like, um, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, like the Kama Sutra, is that illegal pornography or is that a book? Um, and I think that goes for uh, some like romance books as well, like is written erotica pornography. Um, the issue is not so cut and dry as people would like like to imagine. And frankly, you know, I am a more serious like First Amendment absolutist, but sometimes people's problem is not uh, with like the speech or the law, it's with the First Amendment itself. Like the First Amendment is very broad. It protects a lot of speech. It protects even the speech that we really don't like. It protects things that are degrading to women. It protects uh, all kinds of things. You're free to say all kinds of things and you are free to consume them too. Um, and this is part of being American. Let me ask you about this because because I know this is the real sticking point for a lot of folks and that is what about age appropriate materials? Um, do, can, can we break down, you know, there should be some restrictions on what, uh, you know, underage minors have access to or is is that also violating the First Amendment? Oh, as to speech that is obscene as to minors is um, like a different category. Uh, speech that is obscene as to minor states are are free to like um, keep minors away from it. That's why if you're 18 or under 18, you can't go into like a sex shop. Um, when it comes to the Internet, it is extremely hard to gatekeep minors from um, a quote unquote adult speech. If you go on an adult site, you'll see a pop-up that says, you know, are you 18? Um, that's what we have right now. Any attempt to make it more strict than that, to like really try to keep minors off of those sites involves like submitting your driver's license in order to view speech. Um, and that is probably unconstitutional because it prevents you from speaking anonymously. By speaking, yeah, you also mean consuming information. Um, so a lot of attempts to age gate porn on the internet actually end up infringing on adults' rights. Uh, we take that very seriously at Tech Freedom and in the courts. Well, it's it, there's a serious balancing act to be made there. I, I for one, would not want to try to make the case that hey, porn is good, and boy, you know, it'll make it'll make everybody happy if they just have some in their life. Um, at the same time, I'm not one to say I should be telling other people you may view this or you may not view this. But it, it seems like at some level, there should be free, free speech should include not only a person's uh, access to things that they want to access, but I would hope it would include uh, the ability to speak freely and to, you know, for instance, teach kids, hey, this is an educational system. Porn is an educational system that will teach you to view the world through a, through a certain filter. And you might want to think twice before you adopt that as your worldview. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Oh, it's a serious responsibility as a parent. Um, my son is very, very young, so I don't have to think about this quite yet, but it's a serious responsibility to teach them that what you see on the internet is not how you should model your relationships um, and that you need, to, you need to be very cautious online. Again, uh, so I think that's a responsibility all parents have. We are talking with Santana Bolton. She is a Young Voices contributor. Where can people find you on social media, Santana? I am on X at Santana Bolton. Very good. Hey, it was great to visit with you. I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you.
Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. We are happy to welcome our second contributor aboard today. His name is Ed Tarnowski. Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me on. It's so nice to be with you. Let's take just a moment here to get acquainted with you. This is going to be the first time that a lot of our listeners are meeting you. Take a moment to tell us who you are and what you do. Absolutely. So, yep, my name is Ed Tarnowski. I'm a policy and av- advocacy director at Ed Choice, Milton Friedman's Legacy Foundation, focused on universal education choice. I do a little bit a little bit of mix. Like I kind of like to say I wear two hats because I do national policy, uh, and then I'm also doing some state advocacy where I have the Northeast Mid Atlantic. Um, region essentially. Well, educational universal cho- or universal educational choice definitely appears to be one of those policies or issues whose time has come. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with what that means, what what are we talking about when we talk about universal educational choice? Absolutely. Um, so we've seen a an incredible movement of, uh, for educational choice, particularly since COVID. Um, I mean, to give you some perspective in terms of programs with universal eligibility um, and also having like um, universal funding, and I'll get into that a little later. Um, 2021, uh, West Virginia enacted the first universal school choice program. Uh, and now we're at four that have full universal choice, and then we're at 13 that have universal eligibility. So this has moved very fast. It's it's new in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, school choice has been around for a while, but in terms of getting to that universal level where all kids can access it, which is Milton Friedman's vision for education, uh, we've seen massive momentum since 2020 for it, and uh, I think it's going to continue. You know, where I live in Idaho, um, educational choice has been a real hot button issue. And and it's surprising the amount of opposition that has come. And it's typically from, you know, teachers unions and those who are uh, involved with the public school establishment. But um, I've watched state after state enact some form of educational choice. And it seems like that is the, the real challenge is how can we make this apply to everybody? Because it seems like one of the talking points of the opponents of school choice is, well, it's only for the kids whose parents are rich. Do you hear that often? How oh, we certainly hear it, but it couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, we, I mean, the data just shows that uh, people are using this across, uh, across demographic groups, across income groups. Uh, uh, several programs started. Um, so, for instance, Arizona now has a universal um, education savings account program, which actually started as a program just focused on special needs. Um, so you'll hear from similarly, it's not quite income, but they'll say something similar. They'll say, oh, every, well, they'll say um, most of the people coming onto this universal program were, were already going to private school, were already in that system before. But the, um, but the kids that were in the program before were just kids that were special needs. Uh, so th- they're complaining about, oh, it's just, they're going to say, oh, it's just, it's just the rich kids benefiting or this or that. But the data is just not there. Um, it's being used across demographic groups. Um, and it's certainly um, helping kids to get a better education when they might be in a s- school system that's not, not, not the best fit for them. So let's talk a little bit about eligibility, too. Um, if, if, we're, if we're talking true educational choice, and I believe that's something that, that Milton Friedman advocated for, um, it, that means that, that everybody ought to have access to it, correct? Absolutely. So in this context, um, when you talk, talk about states looking beyond universal eligibility, uh, what, what does that mean? Right. Now, such an important question. So to break this down, I'm going to, I'll start with an example. So in Utah, for instance, uh, last year, Utah enacted a, a program that has universal eligibility um, for school choice. So it's an education savings account. So essentially, any kid in the state can apply for the program and is eligible to go into the program. However, Utah's program was funded with an appropriation. So it has a funding cap. So it started at when it was first enacted, that cap was at uh, $40 million for scholarships. So that was that would cover about 5,000 kids. Uh, this year, they doubled that appropriation to $80 million for scholarships, uh, which doubled the number of kids who can participate, 10,000. So the reason this is so important is because we're talking about universal. And yes, Utah's program has universal eligibility, and they've certainly taken a good step in um, ex- expanding the appropriation. However, is it truly universal if the only enough kids can apply up until when that funding cap is met? So, um, so the, we've been um, at Ed Choice have been talking about this a lot, and you're going to hear us talk about it uh, more and more about what true universal is. And uh, the reason that it doesn't stop universal eligibility is because not all kids are necessarily uh, qualified can necessarily participate in the program 
uh, once eligibility is passed. You really have to get to that. You want it to, you want that universal funding to ensure funding is guaranteed for every student applying. And you also want universal usage. You want to maximize the, um, the customizability of a kid's education um, to be spent not necessarily on private school tuition and fees alone. I, I love in your article where you've you've kind of broken this down into the the three pillars of uh, of universality. Um, do you mind walking us through each one of those and just just helping us uh, understand how these would be applied? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to break it down, so universal eligibility is kind of, um, that's the one you you hear talked about most often. Um, but we're trying to change that. We want it to be all of them have equal, really equal standing. But universal eligibility means uh, there are no barriers on income. There's no barriers on um, special categories like um, if it's just some programs just being limited to special needs, things like that. No restrictions like that. Um, anyone can apply for the program who is a K through who qualifies for K through 12 public education in the state. Um, that's universal eligibility. Universal funding is when um, every student who who is eligible for the program um, is guaranteed a funded spot, a funded scholarship. So here, this is where, where I get to the point of uh, like in Utah, only enough. So only it's not universal funding because only 10,000 kids can participate despite it being universal eligibility because as soon as enough students apply where the funding cap is met, they get kicked onto a wait list. Um, and then universal usage is, and this is where education savings accounts um, come into the picture really importantly because um, for a long time, the the whole idea was just, you know, vouchers where it's just the money goes right to it, to the institution. Generally, it pays for private school tuition at a private school. Um, but ESAs open that up uh, to more customizability. Families can divide what they use their scholarship on. Um, so, for instance, um, tutoring or um, special, certain educational therapies, transportation, curriculum, things of that nature. So we took some of the most common and if they met a certain threshold, if the program meets a certain threshold for allowing um, so a certain amount of the of the most common expenses, then they they'll meet the tier for universal um, for universal usage. And having an ESA is not necessarily a guarantee at that. Iowa meets the thresholds for universal eligibility and uni- and universal funding, but being a tuition first program, they have not yet met um, the the threshold for universal usage. Interesting. That's this is one of the best explanations I've heard because I know there are a lot of different uh, possibilities being proposed out there. But as you point out in your article, um, there really aren't that many states that have met all three of those pillars. In fact, who are the ones that that do have truly you know universal choice and, and eligibility? Right, and just to go through the breakdown quick. So for universal eligibility, thirteen states have met that threshold. Seventeen have met universal usage, and seventeen states in Puerto Rico have met universal funding. Um, only four of those meet all three and are true universal programs. So there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, there has been so much success and certainly a lot to be proud of. And a lot has been accomplished. But all we're saying is there's more work to do to get the true universal Milton Friedman's vision of a true marketplace in education where you get that systemic change, where you get the improvement across sectors. You know, and, and I recognize you, you have a quote from Milton Friedman, uh, a far more effective and equitable way for government to finance education is to finance students, not schools. That is a common refrain. I've heard every time that this is, has been an issue in a particular state, it, it seems like it, that's the battle cry is we need to fund the students as opposed to just the uh, institution. Absolutely. And I think it's really important that we start thinking about this differently. And some people will say, oh, well, uh, you don't." They would say um, this should only be available to certain incomes, for instance. But you would never say that about a kid attending their local district school. It, the money should follow the child um, for whatever education, educational setting is best fit for that kid, whether that's private, public, charter, micro school. There's so many different ways, and entrepreneurs are getting. Uh, are really innovating in the education sector. So whatever is best fit for them. Yep. The one size fits all approach, probably not a good idea. We're talking with Ed Tarnowski. He is a a policy and he's policy and advocacy advocacy director at Ed Choice and a Young Voices contributor. Ed, where can people find you on social media? Absolutely. So you can find me on Twitter at Ed Tarnowski. You can uh, follow my Substack, which is brand new, also at Ed Tarnowski. Um, And you can find more about um, Ed Choice at edchoice.org. 
Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Happy to welcome another contributor. Her name is Shoba Dasari. Shoba, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Brian. I'm super excited. Let's take a moment here to uh, learn a little bit about who you are and what you do. Would you mind telling us about yourself? Definitely, yes. So I'm Shoba Dasari. I originally grew up in Houston, Texas. Now I live in San Francisco. And uh, most of my work has been kind of bridging the gap between health technology and health policy, public health, and kind of the uh, private sector and public sector parts of, of the healthcare world. Uh, right now, I'm the co-founder of a company called Flare Health. And what we do is we work with specialty pharmacies, which help uh, patients access these really expensive specialty medications. So think your chemotherapy drugs, your autoimmune disease, biologics, even your IVF medications. Um, we're working with the pharmacies who give those drugs to patients, and we're helping them manage their finances around how they get medications and how they get paid for them. So I'm um, pretty involved in that process. And a large part of my own motivation for starting this business is because I've grown up with an autoimmune condition and I take a specialty medication myself. So I've seen as a patient how hard it is to access these medications and afford these medications and really wanted to do something about that. So um, that's why that's why I do what I do. Well, we've got a fun topic to discuss here, and, and that is antitrust. Now, some people may, well, how is antitrust a fun topic to discuss? Well, it's because... It seems like you read a lot about this in, in the news cycle. There, there's always another, you know, antitrust case or threats of antitrust legislation or action being taken. And uh, talk to me a little bit about to, why does the Federal Trade Commission exist? Let's let's start with what is their purpose in this world? Definitely. So antitrust is um, essentially the government looking for practices that are anti-competitive or that harm consumers, and usually somewhere in the intersection of those two. So when um, in, in pure, pure capitalism, when you allow companies to kind of just grow as they as they might, there are sometimes ways that companies might do things that harm, larger companies might do things that tend to harm smaller companies or prevent competition from building in those spaces. And those often tend to harm consumers or put consumers in the middle of those um, larger um larger level issues that make it harder for consumers to either access or afford different sort of goods and products. And so um, the FTC's mandate is basically to promote that fair competition between businesses and to protect consumers from harm, such as reduced quality of goods, higher prices, or lack of access to some some sort of service. And um, nowadays, the FTC under the Biden administration and Lena Khan has become a lot more active. And uh, this is actually a really good segue into the uh, thesis of what I've written about, which is that um, they seem to be going after companies just because they are big and conflating companies that do really well and succeed in their market with companies that are monopolies. And those are not necessarily the same thing. And the FTC's real mandate is promoting fair competition and not just bringing down big businesses to bring down big businesses. I absolutely love the line you used right at the beginning about how their agenda is starting to look like a sledgehammer in search of nails. That's that's very very well put. And let's could we talk some specific examples of, of where we're seeing them going after companies based on size rather than just anti-competitive practices? Yeah, definitely. So the two companies or categories of companies that I focus on in my own article is Amazon versus pharmacy benefit managers. And um, just a really quick aside about pharmacy benefit managers, they're a super niche middleman in the in the healthcare space. And they basically help insurance companies uh, negotiate drug prices directly with pharma companies. That's their main job. But they also do help insurance companies dictate what medications they'll cover at what price. And they really get in the nitty gritty about the the drug pricing details. Um, But they're essentially that middleman between the pharma company and the insurance company to do all those negotiations and administration. Um, And FTC right now is coming after Amazon with... um, allegations that Amazon's using their market power to make it harder for sellers to profit on their platform and that they're locking in sellers into agreements that require sellers to have the lowest price on Amazon. And FTC is coming after these pharmacy benefits managers with allegations that they are committing um, practices where they're crowding out smaller pharmacies in the market. And that's harming consumers from a perspective of reducing their access to medication, as well as inflating costs, because a lot of these pharmacy benefits managers actually own their own pharmacies that they're trying to redirect business towards. So, um, and but the FTC is also coming after Google. They're going after a lot of big tech companies as well. 
Um, and it really seems to be like they're just going after really huge players. Um, I don't think, and this is that uh, this is the point I make in the article. I don't think that that inherently is incorrect, and there is a tendency for larger companies to commit more anti-competitive practices that tends to be correlated, but that doesn't necessarily mean that if a company is large that they are committing those anti-competitive practices. And so the point I make in the article is to show very specific examples of the FTC's allegations against Amazon and how that doesn't actually lead to the two mandates of antitrust, which are one, anti-competitive practices, and two, consumer harm, whereas the PBM case really does have anti-competitive practices and consumer harm. And so therefore, the PBM case, I make the argument that the FTC's um, allegations against PBMs are legitimate and their allegations against Amazon aren't. And that compare and contrast, I try to draw to show that antitrust is truly about anti-competitive practices and consumer harm. And only those two things. I don't think it's surprising that uh, bureaucracies, and I'm, I'm referring to the FTC specifically as, as the bureaucracy, they, they experience mission creep and, you know, occasionally they'll they'll stray beyond, you know, their intended mission. But how, where does the oversight come from to, to help bring them back on course? Who, who's responsible for making sure that they don't become abusive in their agenda? Right. I, I think a lot of the FTCs, um, well, there's two ways. One is around the court cases that um, are happening. And there, there's a lot going on with Amazon, Google, especially right now, where um, these are being legislated in different attorney's offices and in different courts. And those, um, whatever the judicial system is doing, uh, actually helps set a huge standard for where antitrust goes in the future and where we draw the line on the FTC's power versus where it can is allowed to continue to, like you said, allow its mission to creep. The other is definitely around lobbying and um, the consumer as well as industry perspectives on different issues. And I work in the healthcare space. Drug pricing especially is so competitive and it's pharma versus insurance versus patients versus all these other different groups that are involved. Um, And people actually making their voice known and speaking to legislators and the FTC directly and responding to those Um, The FTC does put out requests for information and consumer input into different um, allegations and um, ideas that they're kind of sitting on. And so those are also really, really powerful vehicles that we as an individual uh, basis, if we're not associated with large, large institutions, are able to kind of make our voice known through that uh, channel as well. I think you make a very good case for for why the FTC kind of needs to check its focus and make sure that it's it's really, you know, representing, you know, preventing harm to consumers and, and making sure that their interests are being looked after. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but can you think historically of a time when the FTC has engaged in antitrust um, enforcement and, and it was really actually preventing anti-competitive, you know, harmful kinds of things? I I just don't know of any examples off the top of my head. Yeah, definitely. I think... Um... I'm not the most well-informed on this particular topic, but I did grow up in Houston and both my parents work in oil and gas. And one of the really famous FTC cases is the one that they made against Standard Oil. Um, So John Rockefeller's company, they were huge, um, huge entity that was basically controlling all of the uh, production and transportation of oil across the United States. And so the argument that the FTC made against that was that they were preventing access for consumers to actually be able to um, physically get access to the oil that was powering their their homes and their their cars and their um, everything else that we use in the modern world. And that standard oil case, I believe um, the FTC was able to break that, um, break the standard oil company into what are our largest oil and gas companies today, Exxon, Chevron, a couple of others. Um, and that has um, arguably made the oil and gas market much more competitive for us as consumers. And we can see this in the sense of like, gas stations and you know you see an exxon and chevron right across each other on the street and you can just go to the one that has the lower cost and a lot of that is because of that standard oil case that happened that's sometime a in the, marvelous know, example here, but a while. <laughs> thank yeah. you so much again we're talking with shoba dasari she is a young voices contributor and where can people follow your work where can they find you on social media yeah, I'm most active on Substack. So my Substack's called Prescriptions for Progress. It's been on healthcare. And uh, that's where I'm posting a lot about everything I'm learning about. So follow me there. Mm-hmm. 
Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. This is our fourth and final segment today, and we are happy to welcome Annika Horowitz to the program. Annika, very good to meet you. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited to be here. In keeping with tradition, I'm going to ask you to do as as our other contributors have done today and take just a moment to give us a little bit of your background. Tell us about who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in a suburb of Milwaukee, and then um, I graduated University of Wisconsin-Madison with a degree in economics, and I currently work at a regulatory consultancy in Washington, D.C., and in this role, I primarily primarily help uh, work on expert witness testimony that challenges agency enforcement actions and rulemakings that kind of go beyond the authority that the agency was given by Congress. So it's been really cool to just see kind of the levers that we have to actually check the authority of the administrative state and um how administrative abuses kind of manifest themselves in practice. So I'm looking at an article that you've written, and this this headline absolutely grabs me. Don't forget that the executive executive branch's obsession with risk threatens our economic future. And you and I talked a little bit before we went on the air about how, you know, that aversion to risk sometimes lures people into giving up some really essential freedoms and things that they really shouldn't give up because they want to avoid risk. Let's talk about... Uh, Why is the executive branch so obsessed with risk? What kind of risks are they looking at and and how could that impede our economic future? For sure. So I think every, as so many things do, it really does come down to incentive structures. And I think that the administrative state was conceived um, to ensure that private corporations had to take adequate precautions that they might not take otherwise because i don't know after the industrial revolution individual workers or consumers who suffered harm didn't necessarily have the resources necessarily to seek damage through the legal system so the administrative state empowered agencies to take precaution to try to mitigate risk. But the problem is that kind of as the administrative state has grown, um, regulators are going to be incentivized to often create rulemakings that mitigate risk beyond the point where it's economically beneficial. So I can, I guess, give like a couple examples. So I guess a good way to illustrate this would be with the Food and Drug Administration. Whenever they're facing whether to green light a new drug, they can green light it. And if it ends up harming a small group of consumers, um, there's going to be lawsuits they might lose their jobs, the agency's reputation is going to be seriously diminished, or they can fail to approve the drug and nobody will ever know. And all of the jobs that could have been created if this drug was approved will never materialize and so many families won't be able to potentially receive life-saving medications. So it also manifests itself in financial regulation. So for example, after the spring 2023 bank failures, um, all of the lobbyists went screaming and they said, we have to hold Wall Street accountable. And this has manifested itself in a potential 16% increase in capital requirements for banks. Um, And it's not necessarily obvious that this would prevent another spring 2023 bank failure that was primarily caused by interest rate risk, but it actually would lead to other negative consequences like making it more expensive for individuals to get the capital necessary to start businesses or buy homes. Wow. It's well intended. I don't don't think anybody would deny, well, we're just trying to help you, but apparently... Too much help is not a good thing. For sure. And as so many things are, um, they start out as well-intentioned, but this is kind of what we were talking about before the show. It's so obvious to know what is the right amount of precaution. And when we think about making decisions in our own lives, we have direct knowledge over our businesses, if we're a bank, over our balance sheets, over the needs of our local communities. And I think that we oftentimes can know 
these risk factors better than any third party regulator in Wisconsin. I mean, in Washington. So as we think about how to actually create regulatory reforms that are going to incentivize cost benefit analysis, we have to think about what incentive structures we can create in order to force individuals to actually weigh the costs and benefits of risk, as well as to make sure that regulators think about the unintended consequences of rulemaking. I like that you, in your article, you distinguish between the two different kinds of risk that are, are typically overlooked by, by regulators. Do you want to break those down for us? Yeah, for sure. So I think the first type of risk um, in the article, I call it uh, a direct damager, is a risk that manifests manifests itself in a really obvious way. So if you built a factory and you didn't have a sprinkler system or fire escapes, and this lack of precaution is going to result in a very obvious damage that's easily traceable to a specific person. Uh, And regulatory agencies can mitigate direct damagers by passing fire codes, by making sure that everybody has the same exact sprinkler system in place. Uh, But the other risk that stems from agencies is what I call an opportunity choker. And these um, manifest themselves in lost opportunities, lost jobs, um, lost potential products that could have benefit consumers, and they're really difficult to actually pinpoint because they never materialize. <laughs> yeah, this it makes me think about well, the two two different authors, um, Henry Hazlitt in his Economics in One Lesson talks about how when you're weighing a particular policy, you want to look at the unintended things that might happen, and even before him, Frederick Bastiat in um, oh, what was it called? He talks the about. Law. The, um, there was another one, that which is seen and that which is not seen. Same, same idea, though, and that is that if, you, if you're going to make smart policies or if you're going to implement smart policies, you can't just look at the really obvious stuff. Well, you know, here's what's right in our face. You have to kind of be creative and think about what else could, could happen if we enact this. And, and it sounds like in an economic sense, this is, this is what you're, you're encouraging is um, instead of just, you know, marching in there and boldly saying, this is how we're going to regulate and, and get this risk out of the way. Think about what some of those consequences might be in, in removing those risks. For sure, for sure. And I think that this is um, going to be an issue that gets to the top of the news cycle post-election, because no matter who wins, we're going to have new agency heads. They're going to have agendas. And when we think about regulatory reform, we shouldn't just think about in with the new regulations, out with the old ones. I think that we need to think more fundamentally about how we can change the incentive structures that regulators face in order so that they actually look at these loss opportunities and a few ways of doing that potentially um, looking to Congress to make sure that every regulation that's passed has cost benefit analysis that aligns with independent estimates, as well as creating a system potentially in which uh, parties that lose out on opportunities because of regulations uh, can seek damages in court. Um, and sue these agencies that take away some of their opportunities. I like too that you uh, you point out, and this is specific, specifically for the Republican Party, that uh, you know the nice sounding populist slogans. That, yeah, people might uh, ooh and awe ah when they hear them, but th- there needs to be some real thought and and substance behind whatever it is that they decide to enact in terms of regulatory reform. For sure, for sure, absolutely. It's always important to pay attention to the unintended consequences and really think about the root causes of some of the the populist slogans and like how we can go about this more substantively and pragmatically often. But again, we're talking with Annika Horowitz. She is a contributor for Young Voices. Annika, I appreciate you uh, sounding the trumpet on this one. And, and, you know, this is something as, as consumers and and just as citizens that we need to be better informed about. And you've done some of the heavy lifting for us today to uh, help us get our minds around this. Where can people follow you on social media? Where can they find your work? I'm not super active on Twitter, Substack, but I am on LinkedIn. So they can find me there. Okay. And, uh, you're where, where else are you published? Um, I've done a lot of future views in the Wall Street Journal, so I think that that's most my most prominent publications. Okay, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much.